And first, let me introduce to you Dr. Uh, Nick Allen, Professor of Clinical Psychology, Psychology at the University of Oregon in the US. Now, good morning, Nick. I think it's super early or maybe still night where you are. Good morning. Yes, it is 5 a.m. for me. So I think that's that's the morning or the night, depending on your usual habits. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us, despite the early hour then. Um, uh, now, as well as a professor at the university, you're also a co-founder and CEO of Kasana Health Incorporated, a company whose mission is to use research, evidence and modern technology to revolutionize the delivery of mental health care. You aim to develop a new generation of just-in-time behavioral interventions of mental health problems. Now, please tell us more about this interesting development and perhaps mostly from the adolescent's perspective. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and good, good morning or good afternoon to everyone there in, in Sweden and anywhere else people might be watching. It's a great honour to be asked to speak to you today and I, I, I'm really looking forward to not only hearing all the presentations but the discussion afterwards. Now, I want to start by saying that I, I, I titled my talk Digital Pragmatism, and the reason I did that was because I wanted to um, emphasise that digital technology is with us and is part of our lives, and that is not going to change. And so I think the critical question is how do we leverage digital technology for its maximum advantage in the area of mental health, and how do we set up uh, regulation, education and good uh, digital design to minimize the risks associated with digital technologies. And that's going to be an important theme in my talk today. So as you know, we are focusing on adolescents and teenagers, and I, I won't uh, belabor this point because everyone will know that the central role now that digital devices and particularly social media play in the lives of adolescents. Uh, so digital devices are primarily devices of communication. And of course, adolescents are extremely interested and motivated in uh, to, to communicate and to, under, and to understand their social world. And, and so these devices are really central to that task. And you can see here is some uh, data from the Pew, Center, Pew Research Center. Uh, giving you an idea, this is of course data that's now a few years old. And it's from 2018, and this, and this emphasizes uh, the rapid changes that occur in this area. As you can see, there is no mention here, for example, of, of, uh, of TikTok, uh, which is a, a, a platform that really is dominant now in adolescents' lives and their uses of uh, digital media, just giving emphasizing the rapidity with which things change in this area. And uh, as you can also see from this uh, data from the Pew Center, uh, many, many adolescents describe themselves as online almost constantly, uh, and, and the vast majority would be uh, online several times a day. So once again, this, is, uh, this emphasizes the importance. Now, from a developmental point of view, it's important to ask why are these devices so important to adolescents? And they offer various affordances that are really critical to the key developmental tasks of adolescents. So, for example, as I mentioned before, uh, social communication and social connection is a key developmental task, and the devices really facilitate this. Uh, there's also the ability to experiment with identity, which is a really important uh, developmental process of adolescence. And this, you can see this uh, reflected in the way adolescents use different kinds of accounts to reflect different aspects of their identity sometimes. Um, it's, a, it's a source of peer-based information, uh, which is something that adolescents are very interested in, information about uh, coping, life, sexuality, a whole range of topics. Another thing that's very important about these digital devices is all of these processes are essentially private from parents. Uh, parents often have no uh, real capacity to monitor what adolescents are doing online. And uh, uh, even though they may, can, they may think they do, uh, some of our data suggests that they really don't have a very good idea of what adolescents are doing online. And adolescents are highly motivated to establish their independence by developing these independent means of communication. And then, of course, there's a, there's a literature as well on the phenomena of boredom proneness as a, as a phenomena that's related to adolescents 
and uh, and and uh, digital devices are are an instant form of of, of social connection connection and entertainment that can. Uh, can address that. So for all of these reasons, we can see why digital devices fit in so nicely with uh, the core developmental tasks of adolescence. Now, another phenomenon that's very important in adolescence is the emergence of mental health problems. And this is a, a, a figure that shows uh, the, the burden of disease associated with different mental health problems across the lifespan. And uh, you can see that particularly depressive disorders, which is the blue line at the top there, uh, really do emerge dramatically during uh, late childhood and early adolescence and peak in early adulthood. And so this is a time of life where these kinds of disorders are really having a big effect on people's health. Um, and another thing that's been very much commented on is the idea that... Um, is the, is the observation that, at least in data from the United States, there's been uh, a, a, some notable increases in, um, in mental health problems that are particularly observable in young people, uh, as in this uh, figure here, the 18 to 25 group is showing an increase, and the onset of those increases is correlated uh, to some extent with the uh, onset of the use of social media in that group. And this has caused many people to conclude that social media must be somehow playing a causal role in this increase in mental health problems that we're observing. However, we do have to be uh, cautious about this conclusion for a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, as we all know, correlation is not causation. And just because two things are happening at the same time does not mean that one is causal to the other. You need to really understand that phenomena at greater depth. And there is a long history, of course, of technological panic uh, that, that occurs when a new technology comes on, on, uh, into the community. So here are a few examples from history. Here is an article uh, from uh, the, the, the turn of the, uh, the 19th to the 20th century about the phenomena of bicycle insanity, which was a, a, a mental health problem that was caused by people riding bicycles too much. It was particularly a problem for women uh, who, who were e exercising some new independence with these infernal machines. Uh, and we can also see other examples such as uh, the debate about the phenomena of the automobile brain, which was a, a phenomena that showed how the um, how driving cars was going to uh, squish your brain into different shapes and so forth. So, you know, we do need to be uh, sceptical when there is this kind of technological panic about new technology and uh, assertions of its effects. Uh, we have recently uh, tried to look at this question quantitatively. We published a meta-analysis of the relationship between social media use and depressive symptoms in adolescents specifically, was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders last year. And if you're familiar with looking at these forest plots, as they're called, um, this shows you all the different studies that were included in the meta-analysis. And when, the, uh, when the, uh, the, the triangle or the square is, um, uh, is, is to the right of this uh, dotted line here, then that shows a positive correlation between social media use and depressive symptoms. So there's th two things you can observe from this meta-analysis. First of all, the overall correlation across all the studies, or association, I should say, across all the studies is very small in its effect size. And this is consistent with all the other meta-analyses that have been done on this topic. And secondly, there is enormous variability between different studies. So what this tells us is that we do need to be cautious because there's probably many, many different factors that are influencing whether people's use of social media is associated with depressive symptoms. Particularly, uh, you know, as you might imagine, the social media is a platform, but all sorts of things can happen on this platform, some of them very positive, potentially, and some of them uh, associated with risk. So there's a lot more we can say about that, and I imagine some of the other speakers might, um, might address it as well. Um, the question that I'm really interested in and that I'll spend the rest of my time discussing is the question of whether digital technology could actually be used in a positive way to enhance uh, adolescent mental health and can it solve uh, long-standing challenges in, um, uh, in mental health services and support that we've really been uh, struggling with for some time. So we have a range of challenges that we've been dealing with for a long time, such as access, how do people access mental health care? How do we target the mental health care where it's needed most? 
how do we how do we intervene early to prevent mental health problems rather than waiting until they become established? Uh, how do we ensure that there is good quality in the mental health services that we're delivering to people? How do we make sure that they're effective? Uh, how do we make sure we implement them with fidelity? And how can we disseminate them in a way uh, that, that really gets them out to the people who need them most? And these are all long-standing challenges in mental health care that uh, digital technology can be used to at least explore new ways of addressing them. And that's one of the things that makes uh, this area, I think, exciting and potentially positive. Um, so adolescence is a key leverage point for mobile computing and mental health because we have this confluence of different factors, the emergence of mental health disorders, their intensive use of mobile computing, and of course the high plasticity and learning uh, capacity that adolescents have because of the way uh, their, their lives are changing and the way their brain is developing and so forth. Now, in terms of uh, uh, looking at this particular question, I'm going to focus on a particular uh, methodology that we've been exploring a lot in our work, and there's a lot more to say than I can say in this brief presentation today, but we are very interested in this method called passive mobile sensing, which is the method of using the adolescent's personal smartphone to collect data continuously to understand patterns of behaviour uh, so that we can then deliver mental health services to the right people at the right time. Uh, obviously, uh, this needs to be done in a way that is uh, extremely uh, uh, careful with respect to security of those data and privacy. And I'm happy to answer further questions about that if, uh, if they come up in discussion. But the thing that, about these kinds of data that's really exciting is that they're objective, uh, they're collected in an unobtrusive way, you can, they're individualized and uh, they also can be collected in real time. And because we're using the consumer device that everybody already owns, uh, the method is highly scalable. It can be delivered to a lot of people. And in particular, with respect to uh, smartphones, one of the important things about smartphones that's reflected in these data is that they have high penetration across different levels of socioeconomic advantage versus disadvantage. So, for example, the, what these data show is that smartphones uh, amongst teenagers are, have shown high levels of ownership uh, irrespective of the person's socioeconomic background, which is not true for other kinds of devices like uh, desktop or laptop computers. We have uh, developed a research tool uh, that we use to uh, collect these kinds of data and understand how these patterns of behaviour are associated with uh, mental health uh, states. And uh, we, we've developed methods as well of uh, taking those data and turning them into uh, uh, signals that are associated with things like uh, sleep, physical activity, uh, mood, social communication, cognition, et cetera, all markers of, um, that are fundamental uh, pillars of support for well-being and mental health. And the tool that we have developed is called the EARS tool. Uh, and it's available for researchers to use uh, through the App Store and the Play Store in iOS and Android. Um, and so just to give you a couple of examples, a couple of recent examples, uh, this is a, a summary of uh, the findings from a study that was published earlier this year in Digital Health, where we were using um, <clears throat> the uh, mobile sensing approach to track uh, uh, language use on the phone and to understand how it relates to uh, experiences of depression, stress, and also to inflammatory factors that were measured uh, with biomarkers. And uh, it's obviously a complex table, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but you can see uh, that many of these word measures here uh, do show strong associations with uh, measures of not only of, uh, of, of, um, of inflammatory factors, but also of measures of uh, depression and anxiety. And that's also consistent with another study here, which we did amongst 13-year-olds, uh, where we collected uh, keyboard uh, data uh, and looked at, uh, their, at the language that kids were using in social media and then co correlating that with their day-to-day -day variations in well-being and self-esteem. Uh, 
So, for, and there's lots of uh, different findings here, but one that I'll just quickly emphasize is the that we find, uh, as has been found before, that the use of first person pronouns is strongly associated with, with daily variations in well-being. So in other words, uh, as people's well-being uh, gets lower, we see more use of first-person pronouns, terms like I and me and mine in English. And you can see this thick line represents the uh, relationship uh, across the group here. But the important thing also is that all of these individual regression lines represent uh, those data within an in, within each individual in the study. And you can see that the vast majority of those individuals are showing this uh, slope that is characteristic of that relationship. So finally, um, I'll just say a couple of things about how we are applying these uh, methods in digital therapeutics. So we are developing apps at the moment and testing them uh, that use these kind of mobile sensing methodologies to collect data continuously and to understand how various patterns of behavior are associated with mental health, day-to-day uh, -day variations in mental health in young people. And then we use those data in order to target which are the behaviors for this individual that we should be uh, trying to encourage and support, uh, whether it's changes in sleep, uh, social relationships, cognition, physical activity. And this is really a, uh, an application of a method uh, called behavioral activation. And then, uh, and and the, this this system that we're, we've built consists not only of apps that the that the adolescent can use, but also of a, a dashboards that can be used by healthcare practitioners, where the adolescent can choose to share their data with the healthcare practitioner, and then the uh, practitioner can share uh, can can examine those data, use them in their clinical assessment, and then build out a therapy plan that then gets pushed back out uh, to the person in their day to day life. Uh, through, the, through the use of nudges and notifications. Ultimately, we see an opportunity to have uh, a new way of approaching mental health care that is uh, uh, scalable, but also uh, varies uh, with respect to the intensity of intervention that the person receives, um, you know, it, ranging from self-care uh, through to uh, text-based uh, coaching, uh, telehealth and face-to-face -face therapy. But the really the important point here is that we want to build a system that allows people to move up and down these different levels of care that they need uh, in order to uh, get the right level of care at the right time without the friction that's associated with getting in and out of mental health care at the moment. All right, and with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and, uh, and look forward to our discussion later. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Just a quick question. Um, do you uh, experience that the adolescents are generous and, and willingly let you take their data or do, is that an issue? Um, <clears throat> obviously, yeah, so that's a quick, a quick answer to that question is that we actually find that uh, adolescents, young adolescents are quite wary. Uh, older adolescents and young adults are actually quite willing to share their data. And, um, and, you know, obviously we do everything technically that we can to ensure that those data are private and secure. But really at the end of the day, when people are sharing their data, what they want to do is get value for sharing those data. The reason people use a product like Google Maps is because it's a really useful product. And so at the end of the day, what we need to do is show that to people that these data are actually valuable to them, that they are in control of how it's used, and that it can be valuable in their healthcare, and and uh, and that's 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 the way we talk to them about it. But certainly, some people are not comfortable with it, and we understand that. Uh, but but at the end of the day, we believe that these kinds of digital data are going to be a really normal part of healthcare in the future, and um, because the uh, the value that they add to healthcare is really significant. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I can imagine that that a whole lot of them want to contribute to something good. So, so uh, I, I see that they want to share their data. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, and please uh, stay on for some more questions uh, later on. Thank you.